Welcome to Haunted Talks, the official podcast of The Haunted Walk, offering ghost tours and paranormal adventures in Kingston, Ottawa, and Toronto, Ontario, and online experiences to anyone in this mortal realm. My name is Jim Dean. I am the creative director, and we really appreciate you joining us for today's episode. Over 45 years ago, a film crew in Long Beach, California, was going about their business. They were preparing a unique set for the very popular television show, The Six Million Dollar Man. The plan for the upcoming episode was to use an existing funhouse in the vibrant beach town. Think of those cheesy funhouses you may find at a traveling carnival where visitors are transported on rickety carts through the darkness. Along the journey, pop-up scares are triggered by the oncoming vehicles and visitors are greeted by an array of creepy props. The darkness is filled with screams, giggles, and everything in between. It was in one of those fun houses that the cast and crew of The Six Million Dollar Man found themselves in just before Christmas 1976. In between scenes, the crew was constantly arranging the funhouse, moving props, and setting the perfect staging for the filming. At some point, one of the crew members became interested in one of the more macabre objects. A mannequin-like figure, spray-painted in bright colors, hanging from a makeshift noose on a gallows set. As creepy as that sounds, it matched the funhouse atmosphere and probably seemed right at home amongst the other jump scares. As the crew member moved over to the mannequin and tried to position it, he was shocked when the arm snapped right off. Probably initially worried about breaking the prop, the crew member looked down at the disconnected piece and tried to figure out how to repair it. A reconstruction was attempted using electrical tape, but another piece of the arm chipped off. And this time, the prop person holding the mannequin was immediately struck with horror. The figure he assumed to be made of plastic or wax was not what it seemed. In his hand, he was holding a mummified arm of a human corpse. On this show, we often think about what happens to us after we die. But usually, it is about how the soul, the spirit, or some unique piece of us might continue on after our bodies have failed us. Today, we will be turning that practice on its head and exploring a bizarre and at times shocking story about a corpse, human remains, that had an afterlife you could never imagine. But before we get to that, we hope your summer is going exceptionally well. The month of July has been quite exciting for us here at the Haunted Walk. We've had Santa Claus and full Christmas gear go on a ghost tour in Kingston. We've had several dogs attend the tours dressed in their own spooky costumes. And I'm not sure what it is about this summer in particular, but we're getting a lot of ghost photos or potential ghost photos from many of our different locations. And we've even had a few guests run screaming out of buildings, which we never recommend for safety reasons, but also wear as a badge of pride. There's just been a real fun and positive energy seeing friends and families joining us for a great night of paranormal fun. And if you live or are going to be visiting Kingston, Ottawa, or Toronto, we would like to invite you to join us. We have several tours in each city featuring haunted jails, pioneer villages, other historic sites. There really is something for everyone, including our paranormal investigations with phantoms of yore. Remember, 
as a Haunted Talks listener, you can save 10% off your Ghost Tour tickets by using the checkout code Haunted Talks. That's all one word, Haunted Talks at checkout on our website, hauntedwalk.com. And I know I promised it in the last episode, but we are now days away from launching a major new experience at one of Toronto's most historic, haunted, and just incredible locations. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, particularly those of you in the GTA. And two easy and helpful ways you can let us know you're out there and enjoying the show is to leave us a five-star review wherever you listen and to recommend Haunted Talks to friends, family, random strangers on the internet, or anyone you think would enjoy it. To understand how the human arm ended up in that crew member's hand in 1976, we have to go back decades and trace a twisting story over thousands of kilometers, back and forth, across the USA. This winding tale brings us through a time when human corpses were viewed with morbid fascination by paying crowds, and when criminals were treated with horrific indignities. This story begins in Maine, in 1880, with the birth of Elmer J. McCurdy. Born to an unmarried mother, Elmer's early life was somewhat turbulent as he moved between different family members and was eventually forced to live with the shame of not knowing his father. Still, Elmer got on fairly well, holding down jobs as a laborer, miner, and plumber. After the deaths of a few close family members within a short span, Elmer decided to join the U.S. Army, where he served for three years without incident. It is unknown why Elmer suddenly turned to a life of crime just after his 30th birthday. Perhaps he was bored, maybe he craved adventure, or he just wanted some extra cash after growing up relatively poor. Either way, Elmer's troubles started not long after his honorable discharge from the army. Him and a friend were nearly convicted of possessing items that could be used in a burglary, but the charges were dropped due to a lack of evidence. In hindsight, it appears that Elmer was indeed amassing the goods required for a crime spree. That close brush with the law didn't deter him. Elmer had received some explosives training while in the army, and he decided to put this knowledge to use by robbing a train. Or at least trying to. This was the early 20th century, and the height of train robberies, those you see in Old West films, had long passed. Train technology had come quite a ways in the previous decades, and the traditional methods of stopping trains didn't work anymore. Still, opportunistic robbers boarded trains trying to get at precious cargo, especially when there was large amounts of cash to be found. That is precisely why Elmer and his friends targeted their first train in March 1911. After boarding the train, the group located the car carrying a safe that reportedly had a small fortune inside. Using his special skills from the army, Elmer set an explosive to blow open the safe. However, either his training was insufficient, or Elmer simply didn't apply his knowledge correctly, as the entire safe, money and all, was blown to bits in a huge explosion. Elmer and his friends savaged a few melted coins, but the paper money was obliterated, and their grand robbery was a bust. 
This failure didn't stop Elmer. Instead, he turned his sights on a bank robbery plan instead. Just like last time though, Elmer's calculations for the explosive charges were incorrect. Rather than blow the safe to bits like last time, this attempt barely scratched the door. After a second attempt was also unsuccessful, the would-be robbers fled, nearly empty-handed. After such a dismal record, one might think that Elmer would trade in his bank robbing and return to his previous life where he toiled as a laborer. But it seems that Elmer was undeterred. He got word of another train that was passing through the area, carrying an extraordinary amount of cash. This was truly an opportunity that could set him up for life, and the dollar signs must have flashed before his eyes. But Elmer would fail as a robber one more time. He and his friends stopped and robbed the wrong train. To their dismay, there was barely anything on board, and the sparse cash probably didn't even pay for their trouble. A newspaper of the day poked fun at the bank robbers' ineptitude and mocked their failure. It seemed that the latest fiasco affected Elmer, and he began to drink himself into a stupor. But this time, the authorities were closing in, and they knew where Elmer was staying. As he slept away his drunkenness in a hayloft, the sheriff and some of his colleagues moved in. The precise circumstances of Elmer's final moments are unclear, but he died of a single gunshot wound in his chest at the hands of the sheriff or one of his companions. Some sensational reports noted that he died in a shootout with police, but this was likely a fictional story that added to the myth that was quickly building around him. Either way, Elmer J. McCurdy was dead after only seven short months as an outlaw. Despite his dismal record as a burglar and the fairly ordinary life he lived for over 30 years, he would be forever labeled a criminal. It was this reputation that seemed to justify the next dark chapters of his story. Elmer's body wasn't claimed by anyone. He had no known family, and his outlaw friends weren't rushing to join him. As was customary at the time, the undertaker embalmed Elmer with arsenic, a chemical that would allow for long-term preservation of the body, and waited for someone to step up and pay for his services before releasing the body. When no one came, the funeral home decided to recoup the costs in another way. After cleaning up the body and posing it in an open coffin, the undertaker put the resulting display in his office. He then charged a nickel per person for the pleasure of viewing the corpse. Going to your local funeral home to view the corpse of a local robber seems pretty strange by contemporary standards. Of course, this was a different time, and the morbid fascination with death that defined the later Victorian period was still common in the early 20th century. If the individual was deemed deviant or a criminal, whether or not they had actually committed any crimes, viewing the corpse held an additional fascination. It wasn't uncommon for people to travel to see bodies of famous people after their death. And before we judge anyone, remember that open casket funerals for celebrities are very well attended to this day, and sometimes well-wishers line up for hours to catch a glimpse of a corpse. But let's remember that Elmer wasn't a very well-known criminal. He was an outlaw for only seven months, and his crimes were very minor, to put it generously. In fact, he became much better known in death than in life. The displaying of Elmer's body was extremely successful, 
and caught the attention of traveling carnivals and their owners. The undertaker received many offers to purchase the corpse for entertainment purposes, but he always refused. It's unclear if he was reluctant to give up his cash cow or if he was genuinely waiting for a relative to come forward and claim the body. But the latter supposedly happened five years after Elmer's death. By now, the story of the corpse displayed in a small town in Oklahoma was well circulated. It had made its way to a famous carnival owner, James Patterson, who decided to falsely pose as Elmer's brother in the hopes of getting his hands on the famous body. The scheme worked. The undertaker gave the body to James, expecting the criminal would finally get a proper burial. But James Patterson had very different plans. The Great Patterson Shows was a traveling carnival that featured all sorts of strange exhibits and entertainments. It started as a circus and included live animals and acrobatics, as well as people who did extraordinary things or looked different from the norm. It eventually expanded to a full menu of popular amusements, which, for six years, included a display with Elmer's corpse. Touted as a criminal that wouldn't be caught, Elmer's status as an outlaw had a certain allure for carnival goers. Even after the deadly events of the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic, people were still paying money to see a dressed-up corpse in a glass box. Facing serious financial issues, James Patterson began liquidating some of his amusements in 1922, including Elmer's corpse. The next and longest-term owner was Louis Sonny, who ran a traveling exhibition of famous outlaws who were replicated in wax. It seems that Elmer was the only corpse, however. As part of this sideshow, Elmer's body would have traveled from the Pacific to the Atlantic. Quite the feat. During a stop in Oklahoma, the sheriff who had been present when Elmer was killed immediately recognized the body. By now, the criminal had been given a modified backstory. Sonny had claimed that the outlaw drank poison before his death, which is why his skin appeared shriveled. In reality, the body was mummifying and the skin was shrinking. The sheriff in Oklahoma disputed this, as did his son two years later when he saw the corpse in California. But nothing much came of their objections. The real Elmer J. McCurdy was slowly becoming lost to history. For a time, Louis Sonny decided to loan Elmer's corpse to fellow film director Dwan Esper, who also intended to exploit the deceased criminal for financial gain. The now mummified remains of Elmer were given another fictional backstory and were put on display in theater lobbies to promote Esper's 1933 film, Narcotic. This time, the mummified skin was explained away by the man's supposed long-time drug use, almost a cautionary note to accompany the sensationalized film. It's unclear if anyone recognized Elmer during his time in the theaters. Although Louis Sonny was a loyal and concerned owner of Elmer's corpse, he certainly didn't respect the body of Elmer any more than its previous caretakers. In one incident, it was claimed by Dan Sonny, Louis's son, many years later, that Louis had deliberately severed the arm of Elmer to play a cruel joke on his secretary. He replaced the arm with some tape and wire temporarily. The original arm was eventually repaired by Dan. Interestingly, the arm that was severed unceremoniously as a joke 
by a careless owner would eventually be responsible for uncovering Elmer's real identity. Elmer continued to travel with Louis Sonny's sideshows for years. He was a regular fixture up and down the West Coast as the Museum of Crime moved from place to place and occasionally settled in Los Angeles during down periods. In 1949, the legendary Louis Sonny passed away and the Museum of Crime figures were all placed in a warehouse. The retirement of this macabre form of entertainment was probably well-timed. People weren't lining up to see the darker entertainments that were once so popular at carnivals. A corpse of a criminal likely wasn't gathering the same support or crowds as decades before. Carnivals began to be seen as family affairs, and the sanitized 1950s wasn't the time for displaying dead bodies. After being shut away from the world for over 15 years, Elmer eventually came out of retirement when Dan Sonny became interested in his father's forgotten collection. He loaned Elmer, with his recently fixed arm, out to Dan Friedman for the film She Freak, where the corpse acted as an extra. By now, the real story of Elmer McCurdy had almost completely faded from the public imagination. The corpse was reduced to a horror show prop and passed back and forth freely. Dan Sonny eventually sold Elmer in the early 1970s along with some other wax figures to another enterprising man who then passed it on to an exhibit at Mount Rushmore. Here, the rather fragile mummy sustained some severe damage in a windstorm. It was probably starting to look less than human, and it was certainly not as lifelike as the wax figures that accompanied it. Unsatisfied with its disheveled appearance and gruesome story, the owner sold Elmer one final time to the owner of the Pike Amusement Park, a man by the name of E. Leersch. The final sad chapter in Elmer's infamous death was about to begin. E. Leersch seemed to treat his new possession with some care. He created a new coffin, lined it with soft fabric, which was an improvement from the cardboard box that Elmer's mummy was regularly housed in at that time. Leersch placed the coffin on the boardwalk to attract customers, but eventually had to place glass on top of it to prevent vandalism. For his part, Leersch later claimed he had no idea that the body was real, assuming all along it was a stage prop intended to look like a mummy. That could explain why the next stop for Elmer's corpse was an apartment closet. You see, Leersch had some of his property confiscated when he couldn't pay the bills, and care for the mummy fell to an electrician named Lucky. Elmer was placed in a closet temporarily, but there were grand plans for the rapidly deteriorating mummy. Lucky was preparing for a revamped exhibition in Long Beach called Laugh in the Dark, where parts of the funhouse would be transformed into a spooky carnival ride. Thinking Elmer was a stage prop, albeit a very damaged one, Lucky decided to repurpose it and integrate it into the funhouse. He spray painted it bright colors and selected a spot in the new carnival ride under a blue light. He then hanged the mummy from a noose, completing a makeshift gallows in the ride that would scare customers as they clamored by in their carts. There, Elmer's corpse with a noose around its neck swayed from a rope for four years, in full display to an unimaginable number of carnival goers. That is, until the fateful day when the film crew accidentally exposed 
the real bones of the mummified corpse, and people realized the horrific reality that was before them. For investigators at the time, there was still a mystery to be solved. Who was this man? Why was his corpse hanging in an amusement ride? Some people likely believed that a recent murder had been committed, and the body had cleverly been hidden in plain sight. Others quickly began pointing fingers at Lucky or Leersch, accusing them of committing an unspeakable horror. But police decided the best course of action was a new autopsy, hoping it might give some insight into the mystery. Without the benefit of DNA analysis, and with all the fingerprints lost to time, Dr. Joseph Choi had a difficult task ahead. The first job was determining some key characteristics of the deceased. After removing layers of wax and paint, and then using the available information from the body, including anatomy and features, Choi determined that it was the remains of a male, shot once in the chest, who had been very carefully embalmed with arsenic. This information already ruled out a recent death. The type of bullet jacket still lodged in the mummy helped narrow down the time of death to the early 20th century. A close examination of the mouth revealed a stashed away ticket to Sonny's Museum of Crime, a critical clue in learning the identity of the corpse. Dan Sonny confirmed that the mummy was a man named Elmer McCurdy, but investigators wanted to be certain. The skull was carefully documented and compared to a photo taken of the criminal at the time of his death. Sure enough, the superimposition was a match. The body hanging in the funhouse was that of Elmer J. McCurdy, the failed outlaw who had been shot in 1911. With the story of the outlaw back in the spotlight, People were opening up newspapers and listening to news reports about the strange discovery of a body in a carnival ride and the incredible journey it had taken over the years. Decades earlier, it had been estimated that Elmer was exhibited in at least 40 states as part of both Patterson's and Sonny's traveling shows. It had crossed the country a few times over and certainly earned the owners a good amount of cash. But, just like in 1911, Elmer was once again a corpse without any money. As the investigation began wrapping up, funeral directors were volunteering to bury Elmer's corpse for free. But just like decades earlier, there was a desire to wait for any next of kin to come forward. This time, it wasn't a matter of money, it was a matter of doing the right thing. After a few months, investigators in California were finally convinced that Elmer's body should be permitted to go back to Oklahoma for burial. So in 1977, Elmer's corpse made one final journey. The funeral procession to Summit View Cemetery was the last leg of an incredible, long, and storied route for the outlaw. Over four decades later, the corpse continues to remain at peace and undisturbed. It would be years until the entire mystery, with all its twists and turns, was unraveled and published for public consumption. Since then, a variety of books and stories have circulated about the horrific tale, recounting how a mummified corpse could travel far and wide and then almost be forgotten about. With the benefit of hindsight, many people have wondered how this could have happened. First, we have to understand the corpses on display was much more commonplace in the late 19th and early 20th centuries than it is today. That is not to say there were corpses everywhere, but there certainly was an appetite for the gruesome and the macabre. People probably wondered if the corpse was real. 
Even back then, horror displays tricked a lot of people into thinking they were genuine. This was also a time when criminals were not treated with any dignity, and their bodies were often seen as objects for public use. For example, it was still common in the early 20th century to use the deceased bodies of criminals for medical experiments and even anatomy classes. In the end, it seems that the story of Elmer's corpse was a tale that became more fictionalized until reality was completely lost to the sands of time. Well, almost lost to time. Thankfully, there were enough clues and a few living people who remembered his identity that could help fill in the gaps and ensure Elmer was identified in 1976. If it was not for that film crew, though, who knows what could have become of the mummy hanging in the carnival ride. It does beg the question, though, if Elmer's corpse was mistaken for a stage prop, could the same thing have happened at other carnivals? Are there other props or displays that have a long history lost to time? Something to think about next time you find yourself on one of those rickety carts riding through the darkness, waiting for the next jump scare. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode. If you are interested in more stories about unlikely places to find human bodies, we recently published a blog post called Five Attractions with Hidden Human Remains, which includes the story of Elmer McCurdy, as well as four of our other favorites. And there's a good chance you have visited some of these. You can find that on our website at hauntedwalk.com slash news. On our website, you can also find information about all of our tours and experiences. And don't forget, as a Haunted Talks listener, you can use the promo code HAUNTEDTALKS at checkout, Haunted Talks, all one word, to save 10% off your tickets for any of our ghost tours. Please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. And if you're in Toronto or the GT area, you want to pay very close attention as we will be announcing this major new product in just the next few days. A -a one-of-a-lifetime experience to get inside, behind the scenes, in one of Toronto's most historic and haunted buildings. As always, a very special thank you to our Haunted Talks team, including Brittany Buss, who researched and wrote this episode, and Michelle Dennis, our outstanding audio editor. If you have been enjoying our episodes, it would mean a great deal to us if you take a moment to leave a five-star review wherever you listen. That way we know you're out there, and it also helps others interested in our spooky content discover the show. Until we meet again, sweet dreams. Sweet dreams.